One of the most important documentaries of our time has just been released, exposing the wrongful kidnapping that is made legal by Child Protective Services. Medical child abuse leading to the wrongful, unwarranted accusations against parents. In the Netflix documentary Take Care of Maya, a 10-year-old is held captive in a hospital for 92 days, and her family continues to fight for justice while uncovering an unbelievable amount of eerily similar cases. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and today is brought to you by a reporter named Daphne Chin, who came across this case years ago and decided to create this documentary. And she believed that it deserved to be told to the world, the story of the Kowalskis, because from her research, she had found that when it comes to the specific hospital, which is the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, as well as the child abuse pediatrician, Dr. Sally Smith, the, what has been called medical kidnappings is actually something that has been occurring for years. And so we're going to dive into not only this horrific story of this poor little girl who was kidnapped, eventually what led to a death in her family due to all of this, but also that there are so many more people going through this. Let's go ahead and get into the story. So it was 2016 in Florida and the Kowalski family lived in St. Petersburg. Now this was Jack and Beata and their daughter Maya as well as their son and this was a boy named Kyle. Now Beata was actually a registered infusion nurse and Jack was a firefighter at the time who would end up retiring. Beata always knew that she wanted a child and Jack knew that she would be the best mother but they did struggle for quite a while to get pregnant. And then Maya came into their lives. And two years after that, her brother Kyle did as well. Now, Kyle was eight at this time and Maya was 10 and she was a typical little girl except for her health issues. Now, by October of 2016, Maya was actually suffering from a severe stomach ache and it became so bad that her parents decided to take her to the hospital. Now, this was the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and Jack and Beata began to tell the doctors that Maya had a history of this pain. She had been through this before and they actually found a treatment that worked. She had been successfully treated for this. You see, a year prior, in 2015, Maya began to feel these burning sensations on her skin, like it was coming from the inside as well as muscle weakness, especially in her legs. She could no longer walk. They kind of turned inwards, and this was the first time she was experiencing all of this. She also was getting this bad respiratory infection. She was coughing all the time. She was having a hard time breathing. She had these massive headaches. And she was only nine years old and in this super severe pain. She would wake up crying in the middle of the night but the doctors could not figure out anything that was wrong with her. And so Beata, being a nurse herself, began to research. And she began to document every doctor's appointment and everything that the doctors were saying. She was recording videos just to see if she could figure out what was going on. In one clip, one doctor was telling them that her being unable to breathe was probably just anxiety. And then you can hear as the doctor left, Maya actually was crying saying it's not anxiety and she wasn't being believed or listened to and it only got worse from here. After months without this going away, they eventually took her to a doctor named Anthony Kirkpatrick and this was in Tampa, Florida, but they really wanted to go to him because he was an expert in CRPS and it was something that they were doing research on because they believed that Maya could be suffering from this and this is actually complex regional pain syndrome. Now, Dr. Kirkpatrick was an expert in this rare disease. And as soon as he saw Maya, he knew that that is exactly what she was struggling with. Now, CRPS is actually a rare form of chronic pain, which usually develops after an injury or a medical event. But the pain is out of proportion to the severity of the initial injury. It's very, very extreme. And it's predominantly found in young girls. But many people suffering from CRPS have been Told for years that this is psychological, that it's imagined, and that basically it's their fault and they should be able to stop it when in reality this is something that is occurring to them. Now, even though this was just a theory, as soon as Dr. Kirkpatrick did some tests, he officially diagnosed Maya with CRPS. And so she was diagnosed in 2015 and his suggestion for treating her was actually to give her some ketamine. And this was low doses for the pain. 
Now this worked for a little while, but it wasn't sufficient enough to completely stop the pain. And so that is when the doctor would inform them of a procedure that might help long term. Now this would require the family to travel to Mexico and Maya would be put in a five day ketamine coma. So seeing their daughter in this immense pain, they decided to try this as an option and they decided to go forward with this in November of 2015. Once again, Beata, she recorded this and you could actually hear in the documentary that that Maya was asking if she would wake up from this procedure as well as if she would be the same person when she did wake up and if she would be normal. And Beata was telling her this whole time, you are normal, baby. She was put into this coma and when she was brought out, she seemed to be doing much better. The pain was almost non-existent at this point. She could go back to school. She was her happy self once again. She still was using a wheelchair because her legs were not the strongest, but her arms were strong and the ketamine that they continued to give her really seemed to be working. That was until October 7th, 2016 when the pain returned and it was seemingly worse this time. Now at this point, her mother Beata was at work and her father Jack called Beata and said, I have to take her to the emergency room. She's in so much pain. So they took her to the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, believing that this would be a hospital that would help them. And Jack and Beata, because Beata rushed over there, they began to inform doctors that the ketamine really did help. It helped to ease the pain. And so they were asking, can you give her some ketamine to see if it will help? help her. However, this is when everything began to go horribly wrong because instead of listening to these parents who had already been through this with their daughter, they completely ignored them. And then it got even worse because Maya was in extreme pain at only 10 years old and the doctors were doing nothing. Instead, they were busy reporting her parents to Child Protective Services on allegations of child abuse. Instead of looking into what this rare illness was and what actually could treat it, the medical team reported Beata saying that she was insistent that her daughter have ketamine and that this meant that she was being abused. Child Protective Services in Florida began to investigate immediately. However, for once, they actually did some research and they found that Maya had been diagnosed with CRPS. Her family was not making this up. Ketamine was an answer, a treatment to this disease. And after all this, those allegations were dropped. Unfortunately, that is not the end because the family would continue to have to battle to be heard. And during this investigation of the family with CPS, the Kowalskis were not informed that this was something that was even happening, though they would soon realize that who they were relying on to heal their daughter would be the reason that she was kidnapped. Because even though those allegations were dropped, there was a child abuse pediatrician named Dr. Sally Smith who worked predominantly at this hospital. And she came into the picture and forever changed this family's lives in the worst way. You see, Dr. Smith had 30 years of experience and especially with child abuse cases. Now, she worked as a medical doctor of the child protection team in the area. So she also worked with CPS. And after talking to Maya's first doctor, Dr. Kirkpatrick, Dr. Smith decided that he was mistaken, that she had no disease at all, that she was being controlled by her mother, Beata. And that is when Dr. Smith would report that Beata Kowalski had Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Meaning that Dr. Smith believed that Beata had faked the symptoms of her daughter or had caused real symptoms in order to make it appear as though Maya was sick because Beata wanted attention. That Beata had this mental illness and it's this psychological disorder that is marked by attention-seeking behavior of a caregiver. Some signs of this mental illness are commonly being very friendly to the healthcare providers, overly concerned with the child, which those are things that normal parents would be anyways, but also a child's history of medical issues with quite strange symptoms, which did match what Maya was going through, except for the fact that those symptoms had been classified as this illness. Signs are also that a child's condition doesn't agree with the test and what the mom is saying is happening isn't actually happening in the child and also that the condition only worsens at home and when they're at the hospital they're completely fine. Now much housing by proxy is infamously known in the case of Gypsy Rose Blanchard and her mother Dee Dee. Though in that case there was a neurologist that believed that Gypsy Rose was a victim of much housing by proxy from her mother though he believed that there wasn't enough evidence to report it so he didn't. But in 
2009, an anonymous report was sent in against the family and the caseworkers visited the home and yet Dee Dee, the mother, was able to get them to believe that nothing was happening, that her daughter was sick, and so they left without any evidence of child abuse. Six years after that, just a year prior to what the Kowalskis were going through, in 2015, Gypsy would arrange for her boyfriend to kill her mother. And he went through with this. And Gypsy Rose was sentenced to 10 years and her boyfriend to life. An expert in Munchausen by proxy named Dr. Mark Feldman said, the control was total in the same sense that the control of a kidnapped victim sometimes is total. Her daughter was in essence a hostage. And I think we can understand the crime that occurred subsequently in terms of a hostage trying to gain escape. Now, this was the same illness that Beata Kowalski was being accused of suffering from. And because of this, the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital refused to discharge Maya from the hospital to her parents. So when Beata and Jack asked to take her home, they were denied. And they were also denied in-person contact after this. Dr. Sally Smith said Beata was abusing Maya. And so Maya was officially placed in state custody and being held at the hospital. The 10-year-old was not only still in pain, but now her pain was being dismissed and she was left alone with no family surrounded by doctors who were doing nothing for her as well as caseworkers who were accusing her parents of abusing her. During this time, the only contact Maya had with her family was through supervised phone calls. And when it was time for the court hearing for the shelter hearing, which was to determine where she would be held, if she would be kept in the hospital, Beata was told that she could have no contact with her daughter. She could not even go see her, hug her, and Beata actually passed out in the courtroom after hearing this. At this point, Maya's treatment was also changed. She was getting a little bit of that ketamine to help her, which was not enough to help the pain, but at this point, she was completely taken off of it due to the belief that Beata was making all of this up and that the treatment she had wanted was harming Maya. So she was taken off the one thing that was helping her completely. Now, in the documentary, it showed that Beata was talking to this parent advocate about how the hospital didn't know how to help her daughter and that she was suffering. And the advocate basically told her, well, she either suffers now for a little while and eventually you get her back or she suffers forever and you never get her back. But this wasn't something that went on for a day, a weekend, a week. This continued for the next three months. Her father did end up being able to go visit her one time, but he wasn't able to tell her anything. He wasn't even able to ask her how she was. And by seeing her, Jack knew that she was getting worse. He could just see it and he couldn't tell Beata how their daughter was doing. He couldn't tell her anything. Meanwhile, the social worker named Catherine Beatty was the only person in constant contact with Maya. She was always at the hospital, always in her room. And the family began to research into who this Catherine was. And that is when they found that she had been charged with child abuse before. She had grabbed a boy's head and he fell down. And when he fell down, she placed both knees on his chest and he was saying that he couldn't breathe and she told him that he could. She ended up being arrested for this, but the charges were dropped. And she continued to be a social worker. At this point, Maya had been held inside this hospital for 87 days and she was constantly crying to her mother over the phone that she missed her, that she wanted to go home. And this was all while Catherine was in the room listening to make sure Beata did not tell Maya anything, really. Could not say certain things, could not say anything bad about the hospital or the social workers. And that is when Catherine accused Beata of being inappropriate on a phone call and was trying to get her rights terminated for contact at all. Jack, the father, was then interrogated and asked if he would keep Maya away from her mother if he was given custody of Maya once again. And of course, Jack, just wanting his daughter, said that he would. And so he went to Beata and he was telling her all of this. And this was just another dagger in the heart of this mother who just wanted to see her daughter. There was another court date and Maya even wrote a letter to Judge Lee E. Hayworth saying that she cries every single day and that she just wants to go home. But the judge read this and still continued to point to Dr. Sally Smith's allegations as the truth and just went off of what she had said rather than what anybody else was saying. The family's lawyer then asked if Beata could simply give her daughter a hug and that was denied as well. And that 87th day, Maya would lose her mother forever. 
You see, because it was now January of 2017 and the situation hadn't changed. Maya remained in custody of CPS, sheltered at the hospital, unable to even hug her parents. And not once had Maya even hinted that she was being abused or that her symptoms weren't real. She was also showing zero improvement in her condition as they took away her ketamine, as they didn't do anything for her treatment. In fact, she appeared to be getting worse. And this is when her 43-year-old mother, Beata, would take her own life. Her husband and son had gone to a party and Beata stayed home and they found her in the garage where she had hung herself. Five days later, after 92 days kept hostage in this hospital, Maya was released into the care of her father, Jack. It had been confirmed by another doctor, finally, that she did in fact have CRPS. This was not something that was being made up. And less than a month later, an independent court discussed Beata's condition. And that is when a psychologist's evaluation had found that there was no evidence to support that Beata had Munchausen by proxy, or that Maya was faking her illness. And before she took her life, Beata had often spoke about feeling depressed and an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. That is when an email was also found from Beata where she had written her goodbye. And she said, please take care of Maya and tell her how much I love her every day. Please tell Kyle also that I love him very much and I hope he grows up to be a strong, good man, has a great future and stays close to God. I'm sorry, but I no longer can take the pain being away from Maya and being treated like a criminal. I cannot watch my daughter suffer in pain and keep getting worse. At this point, Maya was out of the hospital sobbing because she had never gotten to tell her goodbye. That last day they were together at the hospital, they didn't know that was going to be the last day together, especially not forever. Then a court ordered Maya to go off of ketamine forever and never used it as a treatment again. So she had to do physical therapy, which took much, much longer. And she, it was a year before she showed any signs of improvement whatsoever. She continued to have pain, but was slowly able to walk again. But Dr. Sally Smith continues to say that she did nothing wrong. But thankfully, Beata documented every little thing. Every phone call, every test, every statement that was made, every document, anything that she could. And because of this, the family decided to sue not only the Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, but also Dr. Sally Smith and the company she worked for, which was the Suncoast Center, Inc., for negligent and affliction of emotional distress. Now, they were seeking $55 million in compensation as well as $165 million in punitive damages. Now, something the documentary touches on is that this lawsuit is something that most families who have been through this exact thing are unable to do because this is a system that often tells families that they will never get their children back unless they do a case plan which is basically admitting guilt and that they follow every rule that is given. And so they don't know exactly what this means. They don't want to say that it was their fault at all or that they're guilty of this, but they do want their kids back. But they also don't know in that moment that it means the hospital is absolved of every ounce of guilt. And so they cannot go on to sue. However, Beata refused to take this case plan. And so this was what could occur because of Beata. So the depositions began in October of 2021 and Maya was actually spoken to. This was held over Zoom and she explained a little bit more of how she felt during that time. She said that when she was put into a coma with the ketamine, that it really helped the pain. The side effects were almost completely gone and the only things that she suffered from afterwards was short-term memory loss and some blurry vision, but that it was completely worth it. Maya then spoke about when her parents disappeared from the hospital when she was 10 years old. She was not told anything about them. Nobody would tell her where they were or why she could not talk to them, but she said that she was in constant pain there and that they were doing nothing to treat her. It was not getting any better. But Maya would say that the social worker, Catherine Beatty, would tell her that she was going to go to a foster home because her mother was in a mental institution. And this was the only information Maya was getting. In a shocking statement, Maya then would confess that there was one time when Catherine held her down, took her clothes off except for her undergarments, and took pictures of Maya while she was in the hospital. Now, this was allegedly for a court date, but Maya said she was screaming to stop, and it continued. Maya said she now refuses to go to doctors and hospitals, and that is when she was asked why. 
and she became infuriated that they would even ask, saying that she could hear the nurses that were supposed to be taking care of her calling her a liar, saying she wasn't really in the pain that she was in that entire time when she was kidnapped. That is when the father, Jack, would have his deposition. And he was saying how the medical team there knew nothing about CRPS, nor did they do any research to understand her condition. And so they began to get upset at Beata telling them what to do because they weren't even looking into it to see if she was correct. And Beata was trying to tell them that it took quite a bit of ketamine to actually help the pain that Maya was feeling. And so, of course, that seemed a little crazy to be asking for so much ketamine, but they had already been through this and knew what worked. And so at this point when nobody was listening, they had actually, the parents had started talking about leaving the hospital, but then the staff overheard them and began to threaten them if they did. He also said that when Dr. Sally Smith first came in to talk to Maya, Maya and her parents didn't know who this woman was. She did not introduce himself. They had no idea she was there on child abuse allegations. And after 10 minutes, only 10 minutes of talking, Dr. Sally made her diagnosis of Beata and the parents were kicked out of the hospital. That's when the doctors began to say that Maya was faking it all and a doctor told Dr. Sally Smith that he watched Maya push herself in the wheelchair with her feet and Dr. Smith said that, well, she's only 10 so she can't perform the charade effectively 24-7. Now, Maya's parents were still in contact with Dr. Kirkpatrick who still believed that the ketamine was the right treatment and he even told them that without the right treatment, Maya would die a slow, painful death. That without ketamine, she was most likely to get blood clots in her legs that could move elsewhere and kill her. He also claimed that he had spoken to Dr. Sally Smith when she was making all of her reports because he had told her that she was not only going to cause harm to Maya, but the entire family if she tried to take Maya away. However, Dr. Smith went on to separate the family. And Maya didn't go into a foster home where she could still have support. She was left in this cold, dark hospital with no one but caseworkers and doctors to support her who were not doing that. Meanwhile, Beata and Jack were at home fighting often because Beata was rightfully demanding answers from these people and Jack was afraid that her demands were going to mean that they would never see their daughter again. And so they were being pitted against each other. And all they each wanted to do was hold their daughter. Now, as we know, Child Protective Services is known for wrongfully taking children out of homes, but especially in Florida during this time. Families are placed in a very vulnerable position with social workers having all of the power to say and do whatever they want and have this personal opinion be the truth. Accusations are so easily made against parents who will forever have their lives changed by a few words with no evidence behind them. Doctors and social workers have a responsibility to do more than a 10-minute visit and have a personal opinion. Wrongful accusations don't just hurt the parents, they hurt the children as well who will never be the same again and are completely traumatized. However, Dr. Sally Smith had no professional repercussions for anything she has ever done. However, she did end up settling her portion of the lawsuit with the Kowalskis outside of court for $2.5 million and she continues to say that she has no knowledge of any cases where she made an incorrect conclusion. Though in 2021, she was called out once again because, yes, she was still working. You see, a woman named Saisha Mercado, she went viral on social media for speaking out about the fact that her 20-month-old son had been kidnapped at a hospital in Florida. She and her partner had taken the baby to the hospital because they wanted to get the baby additional fluids. They were transitioning between breastfeeding and bottle because she was pregnant again, and they just wanted to make sure that the baby was getting the right amount of fluids. And that is when Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital contacted CPS, who contacted Dr. Sally Smith, and they determined that this was severe malnutrition as a result of neglect. Their son, and then their daughter, once their daughter was born, was taken into custody. And Saisha was very outspoken about the fact that this was a wrongful legal kidnapping. There has been an extreme injustice that's been done towards our family. And all we want is our, our baby's home and to have the people that are responsible for taking our babies hold them accountable. You got to remember, my wife has had two of our babies ripped from her in a, in a level, in a state of, of trauma that most will not even understand. You would have to experience it. And, and every single day we got to wake up. We have to look at our baby setup and look at their, their swings and look at their bedding. And they're not here. And we have not committed any crime. 
We have not abused our babies. We have done not done anything that is irresponsible as parents. And we have law enforcement watching us and following us and tracking us and listening to us every single second as if we have a criminal background. So if this can happen to us, it can happen to anybody. This is my first time being a mom. I've been deprived of holding my babies and feeding my babies. I didn't get to see Raw say mama for the first time. And I didn't get to see my babies meet for the first time. And about six months later, they did regain custody of their children, but not without CPS supervision, as well as demands. Now, Dr. Sally Smith is said to have retired in 2023, but again, without many consequences at all. And there are many other people who have spoken out about this hospital, and specifically this doctor, and the horrors they went through because of them. Katie Legrone spoke with a handful of Florida families who say they were torn apart when the diagnosis proved to be something else. Call 911, Tristan's having a seizure, and I see him holding Tristan, Tristan, you know, seizing. Doctors determined Tristan had a brain bleed, and a child abuse pediatrician knew why. Physical abuse, specifically abuse of head trauma, such as violent shaking injury, according to court records provided to us by the parents. He was seen by so many different doctors before we took him again to the hospital the second time. So to us, we were like, what is going on? Child abuse pediatricians are specially trained to spot child abuse. There are 22 in Florida who work as experts across the state. It's an industry where records are kept private to protect children. And while their opinions can save thousands of lives each year, court records now reveal they can also tear families apart when conclusions implicate parents who seem to have done everything Right. Every year, Viviana sends the state pediatrician a holiday card. Two years ago, the doctor wrote back. I try very hard to be thorough and get it right, but perhaps I need to be more careful to consider gray areas. The procedure of how they commence their cases is flawed. Last year, he represented this young South Florida family, torn apart when the state pediatrician concluded abuse caused 22 fractures and bruises on their newborn. All I can think of was Grandma Nidia Ortiz. This is a mistake. This is going to be corrected. It's not right. The child's pediatric records were not reviewed before the termination was made. The parents were not interviewed. Their medical history wasn't taken. Had that happened, Abramowitz claims they would have learned these parents spent weeks at doctor's offices over concerns about bruise marks. One even suspected the baby had a rare genetic disorder. Turns out she did. In criminal trials, you're innocent to proving guilty, but child abuse cases, it felt like the burden fell on us. That was the most surprising. Now, in April 2022, the lawsuit from the Kowalskis was actually postponed. And then the trial was pushed indefinitely because they needed to be decided whether the punitive damages could be included in the lawsuit. And on October 7th of 2022, the request for the punitive damages was approved. And that is when the trial was set for September 11th of 2023. So it has yet to be the trial date. And Maya and her family have been waiting years for this. Now 17-year-old Maya did an interview with people where she told them that the last time she saw her mother, she was in the ICU. And that her mother kissed her on the forehead and said, I love you, I'll see you tomorrow and she was never allowed to see her daughter again. Maya said, I was medically kidnapped. I tried being hopeful, but there was a point where I thought, I'm never getting out of this place. All she wants is to be believed. All she wants is for people to know that her mother was the best mother, and she was taken from her due to these wrongful accusations. The whole family's heartbroken, and they're so incredibly angry that they aren't being heard, that this lawsuit has taken so long to get through. Maya is now 17 when this happened when she was 10. It should not take seven years for something to be done about this, but I'm so happy that they are speaking out and they said that they refuse to close their mouths because they know it's going to happen again. It has happened again. This documentary shows so many people talking about this exact thing happening to them and I refuse to let them be silenced by a broken justice system, a horrific child protective services, and I hope you refuse to let them be silenced as well. I highly recommend the documentary. There is so much emotion to it. I pretty much cried the entire time. This family went to get help for their daughter and instead 
they were told that they were monsters. Now the daughter has to suffer in pain. And meanwhile, you can't see her, you can't hug her, you have to watch what you say to her. The pressure that Beata was put through, the amount, just heinous treatment she was given, is every mother's worst nightmare. And also in the documentary, after she had taken her life, it showed that some doctors were talking about that her taking her life meant that they were right, that she was insane, that she had done this to her daughter. Once again, completely not understanding the trauma that this entire family had gone through. Beata had been so strong for her daughter until she couldn't be anymore. And I think at the end of the day, Beata knew that the only way to get her daughter out of that hospital was for her to not be there. And that, that sacrifice is something that she should have never had to make, but she did. And unfortunately it was true because only five days after that, Maya was released into her father's custody. It doesn't make sense that these caseworkers, these doctors, have so much power. They're not even being watched to see how they treat people, to see if they have a criminal record. And yet they have the ability to rip families apart. And these doctors at this hospital who did no research into CRPS or even talking to the previous doctor who had been the reason why they were doing these ketamine treatments. I mean, it's not like these parents came in and they were like, oh, give her some ketamine. I think that'll be great. They had proof that it had worked before. They had a doctor's note saying, this is what you should do. It's so infuriating. And I don't know if you guys have heard about this case or watched the documentary already, but I had to tell you when I heard about it. And it just doesn't make sense to me because when parents take their child in to get help, they shouldn't also have to fear being punished for that. Now, if there is real cause for these children to be taken away, that there is real signs of abuse, that is one thing. And, and that is when people need to step in. But the fact that this was occurring so often after a 10 minute interview, Maya is so incredibly strong for what she went through because I think in the deposition, she really went into how she suffered. You know, we saw from the parents' side trying to get their daughter, but that little girl was stuck in that hospital for 92 days. No one should have to go through that trauma, especially not a child, especially with a social worker sitting there doing horrific things to her and also not allowing her to speak to her family or, you know, sitting there telling her mom, oh, you can't say that. The whole thing is a mess. Please let me know if you have any stories about this happening to you or to somebody that you know. It's an anger that I think that anybody who hears about it feels. And so I just want to give this time, this platform to those who have been through it, who have not been heard and have instead been called a monster. For children who were not listened to, it's unfair. And if Child Protective Services are supposed to protect children, they should be able to differentiate child abuse and a real illness. And they couldn't even do that. This one took a really big toll on me and I'm sure that it will on you too. So thank you for listening. And please keep the Kowalskis, Maya, Beata in your thoughts. Don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough. And I love you to absolute pieces.